It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 12th annual Marjorie Pay Hinckley Lecture. I am Mark Showalter, an Associate Dean in the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences, and Chair of the Marjorie Pay Hinckley Chair Committee. Um, now, I notice that we've got a number of people coming in at the back. If you could scoot towards the middle or allow um, some space on the edges for people to, as they come in to be able to see it, that would be very helpful. Um, tonight, we're delighted that many of Sister Hinckley's family are with us, including siblings, children, and grandchildren. We welcome you all and hope that you enjoy tonight's lecture. We are also pleased to have an attendance and would like to recognize President Kevin Worthen and his wife Peggy, uh, Academic Vice President Brent Webb and his wife Amy, and Associate uh, Academic Vice President Craig Hart and his wife Kirsten. I'd like to express my personal thanks to the other members of the Hinckley Committee, uh, which includes Ann Rowan, who's the family representative, Gordon Lim from the School of Social Work, uh, Dean Busby from the School of Family Life, Rebecca Lundwall from the Department of Psychology, and Teresa Gabrielson from the School of Education. I'd like to give a special thanks to our college staff who has worked so hard to uh, prepare tonight's events. This includes uh, Jamie Moser, Patricia Wilson, uh, Robin Shumway, and many others in the Dean's Office staff. And thank you as well to Charlene Clark of the School of Social Work for her ongoing assistance. Please join me in offering an expression of appreciation for the efforts of who made, all those who made tonight's evening possible. As you know, the Marjorie Pay Hinckley Chair is an endowment whose interest funds numerous activities and uh, events that bless the lives of many people. It funds scholarships and internships for scores of students each year. It pays for mentors' student learning grants where students collaborate direct, directly with the faculty and then subsidizes the travel of these students to conferences where they present those research results. Funds from the endowment are used to focus understanding and help us understand families functioning better um, and help families through research and through activities such as this annual lecture. We're grateful for all those generous donors who have made this endowed chair possible. We'd now like to show a short video about Sister Hinckley and the Marjorie Pay Hinckley Chair. On April 29th, 2003, the Brigham Young University College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences announced the establishment of an endowed chair in the name of Marjorie Pay Hinckley. The chair is a fitting tribute to an extraordinary lady and her lifelong commitment to the development of the whole woman and the strengthening of parents and children. Wife of Gordon B. Hinckley, 15th president of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Marjorie frequently accompanied her husband on trips of goodwill across the globe. Over the years, she left a powerful impression of virtue and kindness with millions of people. People who affectionately referred to this loving matriarch simply as Sister Hinckley. I try to make people feel comfortable with what they are, who they are and let them know that they're appreciated, that they're making a contribution. They are. People generally are good. In the church or out of the church, people are good. It was in the spring of 1937, as America struggled in the grip of the Great Depression, that Marjorie Pay married Gordon B. Hinckley in the Salt Lake Temple. But in spite of economic challenges, Sister Hinckley faced life with the bright outlook that would eventually become one of her trademarks. Just before the wedding, Dad confessed to Mother that his total net worth consisted of a $150 savings account and that perhaps they should postpone their marriage until he could accumulate enough to support her. In her typical cheerful way, she exclaimed, all I was expecting was a husband. And now I had $150 as well. I was thrilled. When I look back upon our early years, I tremble to think of the little money that we had to live on. I earned a very small salary, but that was the bottom of the Depression. A few dollars bought a substantial supply of groceries, and we made it all right. 
We built a pleasant home in East Mill Creek and uh, settled down and reared our family there. Three daughters, two sons. It was a very lively household. And the mother of those children was the very center of it. She was a tremendous worker, a hard worker. She was always planting flowers, doing this, doing that, beautifying the home, serving in the church in a variety of capacities and rearing her children. She's been the lodestar of their lives. And they all look back to her as the source of inspiration and one to have a happy time with. They love her, she loves them. A central figure in her own family, Sister Hinckley also became a champion for the family both here and abroad. As she traveled the world, the counsel she gave centered on building stronger, happier homes. Mothering really is hard. <laughs> <laughs> Even at this age. <laughs> but it doesn't mean you can't love it. <laughs> and so I would say to all of you, have joy in your mothering. Especially wonderful were the summers when the children were young and home where I could be the boss. I did my best to keep those summers unstructured so that they'd have time to explore and lie on their backs and listen to the birds. Mother, uh, over the years, your advice and influence has shaped my life. What message would you like to share with these women today? I don't know. Don't worry, I've got it written here. <laughs> My advice is to be the best person you can be. Profound, isn't it? Although her impact on those around her was profound, it was Sister Hinckley's sense of humor that many recognized as her most endearing trait, one that was manifested consistently in her relationship with her husband. We learned long ago that you can't take life too seriously. You just have to laugh your way through. <laughs> I love this dear companion of mine. We've been at it a long time. And to her, I give all the credit for the virtues of our family, including our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. She holds a very bright spot in their hearts, as do I. And my love for her is, extends over a very long period of time, and I expect it will go on forever. The quiet conviction shared by President and Sister Hinckley held throughout the church that a loving bond uniting husband, wife, and children is one of the cornerstones of a strong society and a stable world. Yet statistics showing the disintegration of the family are alarmingly common across the globe. Divorce, neglect, abuse, abortion, addiction, sorrow, and despair, it would seem, are running rampant worldwide. But to the ever-optimistic Marjorie Pay Hinckley, these problems presented opportunities to make a difference. Her answers were rooted in love, compassion, and a desire to uplift others. Sister Hinckley has been described as charity personified, and we're honored to help perpetuate her legacy of love, particularly for families and children who are the main focus for the chair's stated purposes. Tonight, we're honored to have as our Marjorie Pay Hinckley lecturer, or it will be delivered by Dr. Marion Underwood, Dean of Graduate Studies and Ashbell Smith, Professor of Psychological Sciences at University of Texas at Dallas. She will be introduced by Professor Sarah Coyne from the School of Family Life. Marion K. Underwood is the Dean of Graduate Studies and an Asheville Smith Professor of Psychological Sciences at the University of Texas at Dallas. She earned her undergraduate degree from Wellesley College and her doctoral degree in clinical psychology from Duke University in 1991. She began her faculty career at Reed College in Portland, Oregon, 
and moved to the University of Texas at Dallas in 1998. Dr. Underwood's research examines developmental origins and outcomes of social aggression and how adolescents' digital communication relates to adjustment. Dr. Underwood's work has been published in numerous scientific journals, and her research program has been supported by the National Institutes of Health since 1995. In 2003, she authored a book, Social Aggression Among Girls. I was a PhD student in 2003, and I remember when that book came out, and it was so beautiful and everything that I've been studying, and a, just a huge inspiration to me in my own education. Since 2003, she and her research group have been conducting a longitudinal study of origins and outcomes of social aggression and how adolescents use digital communication. Before participants began their ninth grade year, all were given BlackBerry devices configured to capture the content of their electronic communication to a secure archive, text messaging, email, Facebook communication. And you'll get to hear about that study tonight. She's married to a clinical psychologist and has two daughters, now 17 and 20. And she says that being a mother has made her a better psychologist. Um, I've known Marion for a number of years, and I just love to hear her talk. Uh, everything that comes out of her mouth is gold. And I cannot think of a better scholar to better embody the spirit of Sister Hinckley. Marion is, is kind, and she is genuine, and she's passionate. She has such a love of learning, and she really has a joy for womanhood. Um, she's an example for me of a wonderful mother and a brilliant, brilliant scholar and is a, a personal and professional role model in my life. I am so excited to present tonight Dr. Marion Underwood. Good evening. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Sarah. Um, I am deeply honored to be here with you tonight, giving a lecture in honor of Mrs. Hinckley and her commitment to strengthening home and family. Last summer, I received this DVD that we just all got to watch. And as soon as I saw it, two of Mrs. Hinckley's comments really stuck in my mind and stayed with me until tonight. The first thing she said that has stuck with me is that she believes that people are generally good, that people are good in and out of the church. I've always had such a strong interest in mean, negative, ugly behavior. And that is much of what I'll focus on tonight. But let me be clear, I share her view that people are generally good, and children and adolescents can be wonderfully kind, pro-social, courageous, positive leaders. And I think that's ultimately the hope of bringing down levels of negative behavior among youth. When you study mean behavior or read the popular media, it's so tempting to think that young people do these behaviors all the time, that they're constantly being hateful and manipulative. But I believe that nothing could be farther from the truth. And as a child clinical psychologist and a mother and someone who has been reading vast volumes of adolescents' digital communication since 2006, I wholeheartedly believe that children can be wonderfully kind and impressively pro-social in the online as well as in the offline world. Mean behavior does occur, though, and when it does, even at low base rates, a single episode can be incredibly painful. And this is my reason for studying these behaviors so carefully. Mrs. Hinckley also said that mothering is hard, but that doesn't mean we should not love it. A lot of what I have to say tonight and what my research shows is that it's very important that parents make an effort to guide their children's social lives in the face-to-face -face interactions, but also in their online conduct. This is not always easy, but I believe that there can be great joy in it. Tonight I'm going to speak with you about a set of behaviors that I call social aggression. And because so many different research groups have been fascinated by these amazing, subtle forms of aggression, um, there's some confusion about terminology. So let me open by just saying quickly how I define social aggression. Social aggression is behavior that harms others by damaging friendships and social status. It includes social exclusion that can be both verbal and nonverbal relationship manipulation, and malicious gossip. Social aggression is very similar to indirect and relational aggression, but acknowledges that relationship harm can take both direct and indirect forms and explicitly includes nonverbal forms of social um, exclusion. Here are some examples. Are those faces only a mother could love? <laughs> How could you not look at faces such as these and feel threatened? 
Here's another classic face and gesture combination that I've received many times in my motherly life uh, that, con that conveys contempt, contempt and exclusion. <laughs> Very familiar to many of us, I think. So when several of us started studying social aggression, many rushed to the conclusion that these subtle forms of mean behavior just had to be the sole province of girls and women. Social aggression is consistent with unflattering gender stereotypes of girls and women as catty, manipulative backstabbers. There are also research and theoretical reasons to be so tempted to believe that girls are socially aggressive and boys are not. There's a wonderful study done by Malatesta and Haviland with mothers and their six-month-old infants where the investigators had a camera on the mother and a camera on the baby and they filmed when the babies would show an emotional expression. So if the baby would be very happy, the mother would be so happy back and reinforce the behavior and give the baby a lot of positive social signals. If the baby would be surprised, the mother would be surprised back and encourage the interaction to continue. But if those six-month-old infants looked angry, mothers tended to look away, cut off the interaction, and send the message that those expressions weren't welcome. Mother's negative responses to anger expressions were greater when the child was a girl than when it was a boy. So as early as six months of age, girls get the message that anger is not welcome in social interaction. Um, there's another wonderful study done by Hildy Ross that um, was an observational study of two-year-olds and object disputes. So we know that if you have two-year-olds play together, it's only a matter of time until each of them are holding on to a toy and going back and forth with it. Mothers of boys, when that happens, uh, resort to fairness. Say, now, who had it first? How long have you had it? Let's set a timer. Let's take turns. Mothers of girls tell their own child, be a good friend, be a good host, be a nice guest, give it up. Girls are socialized to not assert their own agendas, to know that anger is not welcome. Two cultures theory put forward by Eleanor Maccabee um, proposes that girls' peer culture discourages open expressions of anger and contempt, encourages intimacy and self-disclosure, and emphasizes close dyadic bonds. A lot of research from social psychology shows that girls and women define ourselves on the basis of relationships. And perhaps because we care so very much about close relationships and high regard from others, especially when angry, when we want to hurt somebody, we might seek to attack the social status and friendship um, and friendships of others. But the truth is, as tempted as we are to believe that girls engage in social aggression more than boys do, the data simply do not support that claim. A meta-analysis is a type of scientific study where results of many um, um, different investigations are combined. And a really nice meta-analysis done in 2008 showed that the size of the gender difference in indirect aggression is so small as to be trivial, tiny. It doesn't really matter much. And if you think about it, comparing girls and boys simply on the frequency of social aggression may not be the most interesting question to ask. Even if boys and girls engage in these behaviors equally often, there may be important differences in how these episodes unfold among girls and boys and what victimization means to girls and boys and the social consequences and the consequences for their adjustment. Social aggression may play a different role in the developmental psychopathology of girls and boys. So to clarify some of these issues, we were interested in seeing whether we could actually observe social aggression in the laboratory. Could we come up with a method where we could observe boys and girls and see who engaged in what kinds of behaviors more or less? The method we used follows from a pioneering researcher named Norma Feshbach in the 1970s who observed social aggression in the lab by watching acquainted children interact with a newcomer. An important element of social aggression is social exclusion. And one way to observe social exclusion is to have children in a close relationship. In our study, it was mutually nominated best friends interact with a newcomer. To increase the likelihood that we might see a range of negative behaviors, the newcomer was a peer actor trained to be a provoking play partner in ways I'll describe in a minute. We acknowledge that all forms of social aggression can't really be seen in this situation, but we thought this would be a way that we could observe social exclusion up close. So we had 146 dyads of mutually nominated best friends come into the lab, and they played Pictionary with a third child who they had never met. And the third child was an actor who was 
a difficult play partner. Cheated, messed up all the cards, knocked over the timer, bragged. I win art contests. I'm so good at Pictionary. And we watched the children's responses to the provoking play partner. We coded their verbalizations, we coded their facial expressions, and we coded their gestures when the actor was in and out of the room. These results show mean levels of different forms of social exclusion for girls and boys. The boys are the blue bars and the girls are the white bars. And the bottom line here is that for all of the verbal forms of aggression or exclusion, boys were higher. Boys were more likely to say, you can't play with us. They were more likely to say, shut up. They were more likely to say, stop cheating. But when we looked at nonverbal social exclusion, that's where the girls were the highest. And you can see that girls were massively higher. This shows that on average in a 10 minute interaction, we saw 18 nonverbal expressions of um, exclusion toward the difficult play partner. So what this study tells us is that the nonverbal forms of this behavior matter. And it may be these nonverbal forms of social exclusion that are the sole province of girls. And when we ask children which forms of social aggression they experience the most and which hurt them the most, they tell us it's the turning away of a head, it's a tossing of hair, it's people who won't talk to me. So the nonverbal behaviors matter. So as vitally important as it is to examine social processes like social exclusion up close in real time, I've also been fascinated with understanding how social aggression unfolds in developmental time. How consistent are these behaviors and what do they mean for children's relationships and adjustment? I've had the privilege of studying the same sample of children since 2003 when they were nine years old and in the third grade. Now this group of young people is 22 years old. From age nine to 18, we followed 225 children and their families. We measured social aggression by observations of child, friend, and child parent interactions in the lab, teacher reports, a different teacher each year, friend reports, parent reports, and during participants' high school years, coding of all of their electronic communication. The primary goals of this study were really three things. We wanted to investigate possible developmental precursors of individual differences in social aggression. Why are some children mean a lot of the time, and why will some never, ever dabble in these behaviors? We wanted to track growth and change in social aggression in this, across this very interesting developmental period. And we wanted to examine relations between engaging in and being the victim of social aggression and children's psychosocial adjustment. This was really one of the first really long-term investigations of social aggression, and longitudinal just means we followed the same group of children over time. We followed children from grades 3 to 12, which corresponds to about age 9 to 18. The trajectories you see here, each individual line, is a child's rating on social aggression by their teacher from grade 3 to grade 12, a different teacher every year. And I think what you can see first is that there's just a tremendous amount of variability. Um, there's variability among children. Some are very low, some are higher. There's variability within individual people. You can see some of these lines move around a lot. And at least as perceived by their favorite teacher, children seem to change in their levels of social aggression from year to year, at least some of the groups. Using group-based trajectory analyses, it was possible to determine that you could group these 200 plus individual trajectories into three groups, a low group, a medium group, and a high group. Note, however, that all three of these groups are decreasing in social aggression across developmental time. I think this is wonderful news, that as children get older, they engage in these behaviors less. Note also, though, that this is not as and what is depicted for us in the popular media. Most of us would assume that these behaviors peak in junior high school, or if you watch the Mean Girls movie in high school. But that is simply not the case. These behaviors appear to be at their height for most children in about grade three and they fall off with time. So what predicts following a high social aggression trajectory? We examine several factors, the child's gender, the parent's marital status, ethnicity, family income, the strategies that parents use to resolve conflicts with each other, authoritarian parenting, which is a form of parenting characterized by low warmth and high control, and permissive parenting, 
characterized by high warmth and low control. If you look at what significantly predicted membership in the medium social aggression group, it was being female, so girls were more likely than boys to be in the medium versus the lowest group, and having parents who were not married. So what contributed to being in the high social aggression group? Interestingly, not gender. So there were not gender differences in membership in that high social aggression group. Having parents who were not married, again predicted being in the high social aggressive group, and having a mother who was high on permissive parenting was a consistent predictor of being on the high social aggression trajectory um, across all the models we looked at. So children with permissive parents may not receive much guidance or correction when they engage in socially aggressive behavior. And this early lack of intervention might predict following a higher developmental trajectory for aggression through the end of high school. It's also possible that amidst the warm context that characterizes permissiveness, children who are prone to aggressiveness may learn to express their aggression in less overtly hostile ways. And since they may not get any correction for the behavior, um, they may continue to do it as, at higher levels. It's important to note that parental permissiveness did not predict being in the middle social aggression group, nor did permissive parenting predict following any of the physical aggression trajectories. And although I'm focusing on social aggression tonight, in all of our studies we include both boys and girls, and we measure both social and physical aggression. So it's interesting to know, you know that this changes over developmental time and what predicts children following different trajectories, but what does it mean for their adjustment? What does it mean for a child if they are on a higher social aggression trajectory as opposed to one of the lower ones? So what this table shows is how following different aggression trajectory groups predicts psychosocial adjustment at age 18. This is as the children were leaving high school. And we measured adjustment in several different ways. We looked at rule-breaking behaviors, internalizing symptoms, borderline personality features, and narcissistic personality features. Rule-breaking is just what you think it is, breaking the rules. Internalizing symptoms refers to symptoms of loneliness, anxiety, and depression. Narcissistic personality features refers to um, symptoms of an adult disorder where a person has a very exaggerated sense of their own self-importance and a disregard for others' feelings. Borderline personality is a syndrome characterized by extreme instability in self-concept and emotions, uh, extreme dysregulation of emotions and behavior, and a very high level of manipulative behavior. So what we found is that following a high social aggression trajectory from grades 9 through 12 predicted rule breaking and features of borderline personality, which makes sense if you think about it. Um, rule breaking is consistent, I think, with being unkind and manipulative toward other people. That makes sense to me. And borderline personality symptoms sound a lot like social aggression. But what's important here is that you know, we worry so much about physical aggression, but being high on social aggression appears also to pose developmental risks. So what can parents do? What can parents do to help children exhibit lower levels of social aggression? I think from the beginning, we have to have the courage to be clear that social aggression hurts others and that we will not tolerate the behavior. Children tell us in our research that social aggression is a really great thing to do because you, you, know, you won't get in trouble. The adults don't know you do it, and you'll never get punished for it. I think they underestimate us. But I think they do so because we are reluctant to intervene. If one child hits another, we know full well what to do. That's unacceptable. We will separate the children, and there will be consequences. But when a child says in a three-year-old classroom, you can't sit at this table, or a child refuses to speak to another child, we as adults are more reluctant to speak up and to say that's not okay. I observed this as a longtime Sunday school teacher. I remember in a three-year-old Sunday school classroom, children would try to save seats at tables or keep people from sitting at their Sunday school table. And, and I would say, no, and you can't say you can't play. We, could, we all sit together. We're all part of the same class. And they, the children seem kind of shocked by this. When children are young in preschool, they will do these behaviors in overt ways right in front of us. They give us so many rich opportunities to intervene, and we simply need to speak up. That hurts people's feelings. That's not okay. Stop doing that. We need to send the message that you can't say you can't play. Another thing that parents need to do is to refrain from modeling social aggression for children. 
Children tell us in research they observe social aggression between their parents, among their teachers, among many adults in their lives. This is very, very hard to avoid. I had wonderful parents, and I remember going to church with them and standing around with them in the narthex afterwards thinking, are we ever going to leave this building, you know, while they visited. And then getting in the car and having them say negative things about the people they had just been so nice to, you know, right in front of me. And I have studied these behaviors literally since about 1988, and my own husband still catches me, you know, and he will say, okay, no, don't go there, you know, because I'll start talking about someone that I'm frustrated with um, behind their back in front of my children. So we have to really work as adults at not modeling these behaviors. I think we have to be um, brave enough to interrupt social aggression when we observe it among our children with their peers. And like I say, when they're younger, they give us more of these opportunities, but as they're older, we still might have them. I still remember our older daughter's second grade birthday party. Not wanting to leave anybody out, I ended up with 16 second grade girls at my house for a sleepover. That's a very bad mistake. Um, <laughs> My husband and I had our sleeves rolled up. We worked hard. We had everybody seated at the table for pizza. We were standing in the kitchen eating our pizza because there was no other chair left in the house. And a girl said, let's talk about who's the most popular. And I skidded into the dining room, you know, on the hardwoods. And I said, no, we don't, I don't want you to talk about that. That could hurt people's feelings. And she said, I was going to say your daughter was the most popular. And I said, you just hurt everybody else's feelings in this room. I don't want you all to talk about that. And she said, I can talk about whatever I want. And I said, not at my house. You know, much to my daughter's mortification. Now, do I think that I cut off all social aggression for the rest of the evening? No. But at least they knew that I didn't like it. And if all of us as adults would be a little bit braver about intervening, then I think we might have some hope. I think as our children get older, we need to talk with them very overtly about what type of friend they want to be, what kind of friends they want to have, and to convey that everyone deserves friends they can trust. We need to convince them that if they sit and listen to nasty gossip, to friendship manipulation, if they watch social exclusion and don't say anything to stop it, they are conveying their approval. We need to teach those with the courage and with the disposition to stand up and to defend against these behaviors with each other. Whenever we study bullying in any naturalistic occurring group, naturally occurring group, we see that there are bullies and victims, but we also see children play other roles, like enforcer, following the bully around and saying, you better do what he says. There's bystanders who always provide the audience, but there are always children who are natural defenders. So what would defending look like for social aggression? If we were going to teach our children to defend, what would we need to do? A wonderful clue comes from a really nice study by Donna Eder and her colleague Enki, they studied um, children's lunchroom conversations all the way through middle school, and they just put video cameras with microphones on lunchroom tables and videotaped children's lunchtime conversations. And they accumulated 952 episodes of gossip, and then they analyzed how they unfolded. In 80% of these episodes, after one person made an ugly remark about someone else, 80% of the time, everybody else piled on. And so if one, I'll use myself as an example, if someone said, oh, Marion Underwood's fat, 80% of the time, everybody would join in. Oh, she's huge, moo, she's a cow, needs her own zip code. And it would be this like fun, you know, joining. Aren't we having a good time putting down this person? But 20% of the time, one person present would immediately challenge the negative statement. And challenge was defined very broadly. A challenge might be saying, that's not nice, don't say that. But a challenge could also be saying, oh, you know, how about those mavericks? Or how about the weather? You think we're going to have a snow day? A challenge was immediately saying something that did not join in or reinforce the initial ugly statement. If one person spoke up immediately, it was over. It was done. Nobody else joined in. It had to be immediate or it didn't work. Eder and Enki knew who was popular, who just kind of had regular peer status, and who didn't have many friends. It didn't make a difference. Who made the statement that was not agreeing with the initial ugly comment? That is something we could teach our children to try. We could teach them that specific kind of strategy. When you hear ugly gossip, don't say something, say anything, so that everybody else doesn't pile on. Now I'd like to turn to some of our newer work on adolescence digital communication. 
I began capturing the content of text messaging and Facebook as a way of measuring social aggression, but it turned out to be so much more. It's truly a window into their social world. Adolescents are living their social lives online. Platforms they use include text messaging, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Vine, Ask.fm, Snapchat, and these change rapidly. Text messaging tends to be dyadic or among small groups. Social media is more public. You post things for your friends and followers to see. But just to make it even more confusing, most of the social media platforms now have individual messaging utilities. And so Facebook has a messaging component that is used a lot like texting, as does Instagram and Twitter. Adolescents are moving on to Twitter in large numbers. 24% of online teens used Twitter in 2013, up from 16% in 2011, and I'm sure that number's grown even more now. 76% of adolescents in this country prefer Instagram. It is their social media platform of choice. And Instagram is a, a social media platform that's based on pictures. You post a picture. And Instagram has beautiful filters. You can make pictures look amazing. I can hand my children a picture that I take on vacation of our family, and they can make it more glamorous in about 20 seconds. Many of you probably have these skills. Um, understanding the hidden world of adolescents' digital communication requires examining content. We need to see what it is they are saying in these venues. And in our research, we've examined text messaging and Facebook. And then I'll talk about a study I did with CNN that looks at other platforms. Adolescents are heavily engaged in text messaging. 75% of 12 to 17-year-olds year, own cell phones. 88% of cell phone users use text messaging. 75% of teens have cell phones with service plans for unlimited texting. 54% of adolescents contact their friends daily via text messaging. Adolescents report communicating more via text messaging than any other form of communication, including face-to-face -face communication. They say they prefer texting to face-to-face -to -face communication because when I text, I can think about just what I want to say. 54% of girls and 40% of boys report that their lives would be, would, that their social lives would end or be greatly worsened if they could not text. Like other forms of online or electronic communication, text messaging on mobile phones may pose risks such as interference with face-to-face -face communication or cyberbullying. An Internet Safety Technical Task Force concluded, quote, mobile phones are increasingly playing a role in sexual solicitation, harassment, and access to problematic content. However, we have to acknowledge that text messaging may also provide important developmental opportunities for youth. They crave peer contact. This is a way they can communicate closely with friends. They can do what we call micro-social planning, which is figuring out exactly where to meet to study for the test, or where to meet outside the movie theater to go in together, or what they're all going to wear for the special dress-up day at school. They can communicate and share information about homework and school. They can also communicate with their parents. Texting may well be a life phase phenomenon, a practice that's prized in adolescence because it is inexpensive, it's discreet to the point of even being subversive. It can be done in many settings in which cell phone calling and internet communication aren't possible. It is private from adults, and it's a, it's a forum in which youth can play with slang and develop their own language for interaction. So as part of our ongoing longitudinal study with the same group of students we started with um, in the, in the, when they were nine and in the third grade, um, we had them coming into the lab in grades four through seven. So we were bringing students into the lab with a best friend and with a parent, and we were watching them interact. And when they came in about the sixth grade, they were very happy to do our tasks in front of the camera, but they were obsessed with cell phones. They all came in clutching cell phones. And they were texting, much to their parents' embarrassment. Their parents would say, stop that, don't do that, in front of the researchers. Um, at that same time, I got a Blackberry for my own personal use, for working mother reasons. I thought I would just read email when I was sitting at the ballet studio or at a soccer game. It would be a way to keep up with work when I wasn't able to be there. And I had had it just for a few days when I realized that I was holding not only the internet in my hand, 
I was holding my entire social network. So I called back the woman who had sold me my Blackberry at a Sprint store and said, could you work up a budget? Could you give me how much it would cost to buy 200 Blackberries? And I'd like you to set them up so that all the communication would get, you know, pointed to a, a server where it could be saved and where I could code it. And she said, I don't think you can do that. And I said, no, no, there has to be a way. And she said, well, let me call my friends. So she called a man who was a Sprint Higher Education Software Solutions Engineer. And lucky for me, right about this time, just a few months before, the Federal Trade Commission had passed federal laws that financial corporations were required to monitor and archive their employees' text messaging communication to ensure compliance with federal law. So in response to this law, all these companies sprung up who had the technology to capture text messaging. And so this young man, this one man who worked for Sprint, helped me figure it out. And we came up with a way to give the students in our ongoing longitudinal study BlackBerry phones um, configured to capture the content of all of their text messaging, their instant messaging, and their email um, for four years as they moved through high school. In presenting some of the preliminary results of the BlackBerry phase of the project, I'm going to focus on adolescents' use of text messaging because it's so abundantly clear to us that this plays a huge role in their lives. Our data made clear that our students were using the Blackberries enthusiastically. This shows average daily usage measured from electronic billing records over September through November of 2009 when our sample was 15 and in the 10th grade. So you can see the average numbers of ingoing and outgoing texts. They were very large. I want to mention that um, all the students and their parents knew that we were providing these phones with the paid service plans and that we were monitoring the communication. The archiving service we used allows um, electronic searches of the entire archive. So at least once a week, we would search for about 80 keywords that um, helped us determine whether any of the members of our sample were feeling suicidal or being abused. We would do these electronic searches for keywords, follow up with kids we needed to. It's very clear that usage is high. Over half a million text messages per month poured into our archive. I can tell you that much of the communication is between friends and much of it is positive and supportive. We also see considerable texting between parents and children. When we would give the students the phone for the first time, the first thing they wanted to do was to email their parents and tell their parents how to text. They wanted to engage their parents in texting. The amount of frank conversation between peers and discussion of sexual and antisocial activity suggested to us that most were communicating openly and that little censoring seemed to be going on. So one way to look at this um, we looked at a two-day sample of text messaging gathered in the fall of 2009 that included over 43,000 text messages, and we used some software called Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count to count um, cer certain kinds of words, and we found that about 6% of utterances contained sexual themes, 7% of utterances included profane language, um, and these levels were very comparable to what is seen in um, online unmonitored chat rooms. Some of the things I saw made me disgusted and want to wash my eyes. That's an example. I'm not reading it out loud. We're moving on. 70% um, of what adolescents send in their text messaging is positive or neutral. And we saw some of the most wonderful examples of adolescents using text messaging to engage in intimate, supportive behavior. So here's one example. This is a boy writing to a male friend. You just got some problems, but hey, who doesn't? As long as you have someone you can talk to and tell things to, I promise you things will feel a lot better. There are so many people in the world with problems, but they refuse to tell people and open up because honestly, these days, you can't trust anyone. But I'm promising you, I'm here to hear it, and everything is between us two. Now wait, does your mom do this? What does your mom do while all this drama between you and your dad is going on? And did your parents send you to live with them? Or were you just super close to them growing up? I want to move down and talk about Facebook. 20 million minors use Facebook, 7.5 million of whom are under the age of 13. 
just in case you don't know, it's federal law that you are not to be on Facebook or any social media platform until you are 13 because of, kind of, the, because of the kind of advertising found there. But many parents permit their children to go on these platforms much earlier by lying about their birthdays. 73% of adolescents and 72% of young adults ages 18 to 29 use social networking websites. Of the 90% of university students who use social networking sites, 97 use Facebook and 97 report daily Facebook activity. University students in the US and Canada report spending an average of over one hour and 40 minutes daily on Facebook. That is 100 minutes. So for 175 members of our sample, the same longitudinal study, we captured the content of their Facebook communication as they made the transition beyond high school. And we wanted to know how do particular types of Facebook communication relate to qualities of relationships and adjustment. For the sake of time, I'm just going to select a couple of findings to highlight for you here. The first study I'll describe was focused on the question, um, how does antisocial text messaging contribute to growth in externalizing symptoms across the ninth grade year? And externalizing behaviors just mean uh, behavior problems that you can see, so aggression and rule breaking. We were interested in a developmental theory about children's in-person social interactions called deviancy training. Deviancy training is when antisocial youth encourage and reinforce their peers' discussion of delinquency. Tom Bichon has done wonderful research that shows that um, when young men, both of whom engage in antisocial behavior, talk in their just regular conversations, they sit around and talk about negative topics. They talk about which convenience store to rob. They encourage each other in their deviant behavior. They're more likely to reinforce their peers discussing delinquency and to the extent that these young men engage in this deviant peer communication, their antisocial behavior increases. We thought that text messaging might be an ideal forum for youth to discuss antisocial activities with their peers for a number of reasons. First of all, it's highly discreet. It's largely unsupervised, and youth have constant access to it. The base rate of antisocial behavior in our text messaging communication was actually pretty low. But what we did see was interesting and colorful and predicted some important things. So here's an example of text messaging about substance use. These are ninth grade girls. One girl says, hey Daisy, let's skip fourth so we can do tea which means marijuana. Daisy says back to Mindy, that's a great idea, but I'm already in class. Mindy says to Daisy, okay, let's skip fifth. Where do we meet so I can give you some? And Daisy says back to Mindy, I can't skip fifth period. I have a test. So Mindy says, okay, go to the restroom where we met last time and we'll just smoke quick. So what we believe is true is that in some fear peer groups, fitting in could require cheering each other on in antisocial behavior and instructing each other in how to engage in rule-breaking activities at times on the school campus during the day. These girls are texting at school during their school day about where to meet in the school to smoke marijuana. Not surprisingly, antisocial text messaging predicted increases in rule-breaking across the ninth grade year even when we controlled for baseline rule breaking. Texting about rule breaking, aggression, substance use, and property crime predicted increases in rule breaking and in aggression across the ninth grade year as reported by the young person themselves, their teacher, and the parents. Note the lack of interactions with gender. This process worked exactly the same way for girls and boys. And there was no gender difference in frequency of antisocial communication. Girls and boys were equally frequently involved in this communication, and it seemed to predict growth in rule-breaking behavior in the same way. So the research that, um, that I've done on digital communication with our participants in our longitudinal study started in 2008 when our students were 14 and beginning the ninth grade. I recently had the opportunity to consult on a similar study with 13-year-olds um, and we captured the content of their social media. 
we um, captured the content of, the tw of their Twitter, their Facebook, and their Instagram. And this was a study designed in consultation with Bob Ferris, a sociologist at UC Davis, and with the Anderson Cooper 360 program at CNN. This documentary aired on October 5th, and it's available online. If you just Google hashtag being 13, you can go right to a website where you can view the entire 40-minute um, documentary. And it is truly a work of art. The, the way they told the story of the study in the documentary is amazing. I was surprised by several results of the study with 13-year-olds. So many of them were very heavy users of social media, mostly Instagram, but some on Twitter. It was clear that online experiences were vitally important to these students. And in fact, when we asked them, what is more important to you, your offline social experiences, your, your online, they said online social experiences were more important in their lives. Most of what we saw in the archive for the study was just kids being kids, but there was some truly alarming content. When we asked students, what's the worst thing that ever happened to you on social media, 40% of them said experiences of social exclusion. In the offline world, just as in the, on, in the online, just as in the offline world, social exclusion is so painful. They said things like being excluded to parties. I figured out a girl that I knew and we were friends blocked me. My best friends hung out without me and posted it on Instagram. My friends went out without me and posted pictures and they denied they were out together. Not anything specific, but I don't like it when people post pictures or tweet about a party that I wasn't invited to. Seeing pictures posted by my friends doing things where I wasn't included. Social media breaks down boundaries and suddenly children can see what everyone is doing and with whom. There's so much about this that worries me, but one frightening aspect is that what seems to hurt children the most in the online social world is so subtle that even the most vigilant parent who might be trying to monitor their child's social media for cyberbullying might not pick this up. What hurts them the most is very difficult for adults to see. In general, in this study, parents and children both reported that parents know very little about their children's online lives and that attempts at parental monitoring were largely ineffective. We found that parents simply being friends with children on social media was insufficient to protect them from distress. Teens whose parents were friends with them on Facebook or Twitter and Instagram were no less distressed than others. Again, this might be due to the fact that what young people report that is the most upsetting behavior is the kind of thing that's so subtle that their parents wouldn't even be able to realize it, even if they'd been reading every word of the child's social media feed. Parental monitoring did make a difference, though, for, young, for 13 year olds who reported experiencing online conflicts. Teens who experienced conflict were more significantly distressed than others, but mainly when their parents weren't monitoring their online activities. So this um, higher green bar shows kids who reported conflict on social media. And at low levels of parental monitoring, they had much higher levels of distress. But at high levels of parental monitoring, their level of distress fell. So parental monitoring, just the child perceiving that the parent was paying attention to what they were doing on social media, appeared to buffer children who experienced conflict from being more distressed. Another surprising finding of the study was the frequency with which 13-year-olds spent time online lurking. Lurking is a word that young people use for reading social media feeds without posting. The average 13-year-old in the Being 13 study posted about four times a week, typically on Instagram but they reported looking at social media without posting or commenting much more frequently. More than a third of these respondents reported checking social media feeds more than 25 times a day on a typical weekend. Figures are a bit lower for school days, likely because of restrictions on devices during school hours. We asked them why they did all this lurking, and their reasons for lurking suggested that they were constantly scrolling social media feeds to stay in contact with their peers, to see whether their own posts were getting likes or comments, something that's incredibly important. I think it's really troubling that one in five said they check social media feeds in order to make sure that no one is saying mean things about them, and over one third check to see if their friends are doing things without them. Above all else, teens check social media because they're bored. All of this lurking is related to psychological distress. 
we found that the frequency of lurking was significantly related to distress, and distress was a combined index of anxiety, depression, loneliness. Compared to a typical teen in our sample who checked social media two to five times a day, those who checked 26 to 50 times and 50 to 100 times a day are 28% and 37% more distressed on average. And the nearly 10% of this group of 13-year-olds who check more than 100 times a day are about 47% more distressed on average. We found similar results uh, for weekends as we did for weekdays. And we caution that these don't indicate causal relationships. They just suggest a correlation between lurking and distress. So what are the perils of lurking? As discussed earlier, the more time teens spend lurking online, the more they're likely to see their friends having a wonderful time without them. And this is extremely painful. Spending lots of time lurking could also make adolescents feel terrible about themselves and their lives because they're comparing their inner emotional experience to everyone else's filtered, carefully selected, highly curated pictures showing the most positive features of their lives. Vulnerable youth could suffer social comparison from lurking, from feeling sad about the fact that they have fewer social opportunities or friends than other people, and from believing that others have better or happier lives. This could lead to depression, as may have happened for a young woman named Madison Holleran. Madison Holleran was a first-year student at University of Pennsylvania, an Ivy League school, um, who was unhappy in her first year of college. She was a long-distance runner there on a scholarship. She wasn't sure she liked the running program. She was overwhelmed by her academics. She did not feel socially comfortable. Through the fall, she posted beautiful pictures on Instagram that reassured her parents that she might be doing better than she said she was when they talked to her. But she told them how upset she was, and she told her roommates at Penn that it made her so sad to look at Instagram and see how happy her friends were from high school at their colleges compared to how unhappy she herself was. Her parents were worried about her and got her started in therapy over Thanksgiving and continued through the Christmas holidays. And two days after her father took her back to college in January, she went into Philadelphia, took a picture of trees glittering with lights that were still up from Christmas, posted a picture on Instagram about the beauty of the city, and then jumped off the top of a parking garage and lost her own life. I don't think Instagram killed Madison Holleran, but I think the sense that her own life was worse by comparison to other people may have been a factor. Um, ESPN.com actually published a really interesting series of articles there by Lisa Fagan about Madison Holleran um, showing what she posted on Instagram through this fall when she was so happy and interviewing her friends. Regardless of social status, Online lurking could be stressful because the social media feed essentially serves as a scorecard for popularity. <clears throat> Rachel Simmons has said Instagram is the homework that girls always do. They look at it constantly to compare their own social opportunities to those of their friends, comparing numbers of friends and followers, likes and comments, and to what extent others' posts mm -hmm. get more or positive feedback, more or less positive feedback. What youth lose when they spend all this time lurking online is time to think and daydream and problem solve and read and converse with others and do homework and enjoy the beauty of nature and engage in physical activity and spend time with their families. For others, the price is far greater. Constantly lurking online generates stress and sadness for vulnerable youth because it exposes them to the pain of social exclusion, feeling like everybody else is having a fabulous time, and seeing numbers that reflect where they stand in the social order. When I think about this, I think being 13 just got a lot more complicated. However, the fact remains, adolescents love social media. They enjoy it. Most report that social media makes them feel great about themselves. And they view social media as a positive force because it increases their knowledge about their friends, it helps them understand friends' feelings, and it provides a source of social support. Social media has many possible developmental benefits. It could foster communication with parents. As a mother with a child away at college, I'm so thankful for everything she tweets and posts and puts on Tumblr. I'm looking at all of it, and I feel like I have a little window into her world. I know it's not everything she's doing, and I know it's not her true inner experience, but it's something. It can be used for planning, as I said before, for information exchange with peers, for encouragement and social support. 
and wonderful new research shows that youth who are positive and pro-social offline show pro-social behavior in the online world as well. Here's an example of pro-social behavior on Instagram from the Being 13 study. A 13-year-old boy posted a picture with the caption, I am reposting this because some of you guys are so retarded you thought I was promoting a honey company. A 13-year-old girl commented, please don't use the word retarded out of context. Retarded is defined as someone who is mentally slow. It should not be used to call someone stupid. Peers criticized her for making this statement, but she responded, retarded is not supposed to mean stupid or dumb. It's a word to describe a person who has a mental problem that makes them slower than others. All I said is he shouldn't use the word retard as an insult because it is demeaning to someone who is actually retarded and he doesn't have to. I just think he should think about it because it's considered insensitive and a lot of people care. You don't have to, but I know I'm not the only person who cares and I just said he shouldn't use retarded as an insult. That's a very brave piece of pro-social behavior right there for 13. So what can parents do to help our young people use social media, digital communication for good? I think if we have children on these platforms, we need to join them and we need to be our children's friends and followers. We need to do this for lots of reasons. First, if your child is tweeting things out to thousands of people, you really need to see what it is. If they have this large public audience, you need to be a part of it. You need to know it's not necessarily everything on their hearts, but it's something and you need to see it. By creating your own account and joining these platforms, you will understand the power of digital communication in a way you never thought possible. I joined Facebook initially to kind of follow my own daughters. I will freely admit that. When I got a grant to study Facebook, I thought I will post one thing on Facebook every week so that I understand how this works. And I was amazed at how thrilled I was by getting likes and comments, how amazingly reinforcing it was. So we need to sign up for these things and be part of them so we understand their power. I think we all need to structure our homes and our children's time to avoid over-involvement with social media, over-involvement with posting, and over-involvement with lurking. Here are just some basic rules. No phones at night. 85% of our students in the Blackberry study said they slept with their Blackberries under their pillows so they could hear an incoming text in the middle of the night. Disruption in sleep is terrible for adolescents' mood. It is a very bad thing. Uh, no phones during meals. No phones during family meals at home. No phones during family meals at restaurants. And that includes parents. Everybody has to put their phone away. A rule that I had when I would miss my work time to drive my children around in the carpools was no phones in the car. If I'm spending my time to take my young ladies places, I wanted them to be conversing with me. So I would say, you're not going to look at your phone when you're in the car with me. We're going to talk about your day. And every family can come up with their own set of guidelines. Most of all, I think we need to talk with children about their online social lives. I'm not a big fan of monitoring software. Young people are very smart about how to get around it, and platforms change all the time. Our best hope of influencing their online conduct, their online experience, is to use our relationships to discuss with them. Here's a wonderful quote from Dana Boyd, who's written an amazing book called It's Complicated, The Network Social Lives of Teens. She says, what makes the digital streets safe is when teens and adults collectively agree to open their eyes and pay attention, communicate, and collaboratively negotiate difficult situations. Teens need the freedom to wander the digital street, but they also need to know that caring adults are behind them and supporting them everywhere they go. The first step is to turn off the tracking software, then ask your kids what they're doing when they're online and why it's so important to them. Thank you very much. Doing this lecture means the world to me. It's such an honor. Thank you for inviting me. Well, that was a wonderful example of cutting edge research mixed with wonderful advice. Um, and so we're going to take a few minutes to have some questions from the audience. Um, we've got three roving mics that will be going around. Uh, and if you have a question, before you ask it, please state your name and give your affiliation. For example, if you're a student, tell us what your major is. If you're a member of the community, say something about where you're from. But uh, please keep your questions short. 
and uh, we'll let turn the time back over to Dr. Underwood. Hi, my name is Nicole. I'm an MSW student here. Um, I'm just curious about your daughter's response to your limiting social media and things like that in the car and when they maybe grunted and, you know, kind of got upset about it. How did you respond to that and how did they take that? You know, I, I think I just did it from the very beginning, so they didn't question it. Um, they were glad that I would leave my work early to be the one who could be in the carpool line and take them places. I think they appreciated that, that time together, and they just accepted that um, it wasn't going to be screen time. You know, I, I bought a car that has a fancy electronic system, kind of by mistake. It was the color I wanted. It had all the stuff. And I have never, I've never let them watch the DVD player in the car with me either. They're only allowed to watch that on long trips. Um, so I was, they were kind of used to me limiting devices. They didn't have video games when they were young. They claimed they were raised Amish and, and that it was, you know, truly hilarious that I was studying technology when I didn't let them have any of it. So uh, I exerted pr a pretty high level of control and they didn't seem to mind. I also tried to make it fun to be in the car. You know, I would show a lot of interest in them and we would have fun conversation. It wasn't just everybody being grouchy and exhausted. Um, we would, I would try to engage with them and get them to tell me about their day, um, and it meant a lot to me. So I didn't meet great resistance. I think if I had ever allowed the phones in the car, it would have been harder to take them away. But they, they took it pretty well. Pat, we're supposed to find this stuff. Hello. Are you interested in your longitudinal data? Yes. We start with the third grade, mm -hmm. and you show the trend over time with mm -hmm. all three groups. Mm -hmm. But in your, in your lecture, you also talked about preschoolers. Oh, yes. So is there a reason to believe that if you had data from children younger mm -hmm. than third grade, those lines would be even higher for those children at, say, the first grade or kindergarten? Um, I'm not really sure if the lines would be higher, but we know that um, social aggression does emerge in the preschool years. When I first read these studies of these behaviors with really young children, I didn't want to believe it. It didn't fit with my experience or my sense of what young children were like. And then I became a mother. And when our daughter was three, she started talking about who was and wasn't going to the birthday parties. And then one day, um, she said she wanted Cheetos for breakfast. I said, no. We went back and forth. And she looked me right in the eye and said, if I didn't give her what she wanted, she would tell Daddy not to be my best friend anymore. Um, I, ha I tried not to laugh. I'm, I think these behaviors come online for some children as soon as, as soon as they learn to speak. But I'm not sure that all of them engage in these behaviors all that frequently. I believe there were probably vast individual differences in preschool just as there are any other time. Um, it would be wonderful to start with preschool and to see what the developmental trends look like. I think we might have hit the peak in about third grade. Um, given my sense of young children, I think that is a time when kids start to feel very confident, to care very deeply about who's in and who's out. You start to see students form informal clubs and do all this kind of systematic social exclusion. I think almost by accident we may have hit the peak when we started in the second, in the third grade. Um, when I designed this study, I thought I would catch the beginning of the growth. I really thought these behaviors were at their peak in junior high school, so I thought surely if I start at age nine, I'll catch the peak. I'm not sure I did. I think I should have started earlier. And of the many studies that I would love to do, that's one. You know, I would love to start with a very young sample, almost, it almost ought to be 18 months, I think, to really capture what's going on in the home and with the parents' marriage and the parents' communication and how the child is being socialized and then watch as they get really comfortable with language to see how that happens. Another study I'd love to do would be to catch the beginning of involvement with social media, which really ought to be 13, but we know it's not. So I think I would need to start with seven or eight year olds to really catch uh, families before um, young people start using online communication. Thank you. So let's take the one over here and then we'll go to the back after that. My name is Ashley Frost. I'm studying public relations, and a, a lot of the, our major is dealing with social media. And so I was wondering with the trends that you saw, you said you were still monitoring them at 23. Did you see those lurking, the social media lurking, those sort of trends going into the college students' lives? You know, we didn't, me um, we didn't measure lurking in my longitudinal study, and we haven't had active data collection with our samples since they were 20. And we're just now going to bother them again at age 22 and see if we can get them to do some online things. But I would like to ask them some lurking questions. 
I truly did not myself understand this lurking phenomenon until we did the 13 year, um, the study of the 13 year olds with the CNN team. I did not understand how much time some young people would spend staring at social media. And it was truly naivete on my part. I, I simply didn't get it. I don't do that as a grown person. The children I raised didn't do it because I kept them busy in activities. That finding that young people lur lurk because they're bored. We, we also have wonderful research that shows that a lot of social aggression happens because young people are bored. They say they engage in it because they are bored. I think we could arrange for our children to be a little less bored. And I think having them engaged in activities is a way to keep them from lurking. I will ask our 22 year olds about lurking and I will be very interested to see what they find. Um, we really have to find better ways to study lurking. It's a hard thing to measure, you know, it's because so many of them have devices they're staring at constantly. How can you possibly record how much they're looking at that stuff? And how can you know how much it hurts them? It's a challenge. So I don't have the data, but I, I would like to get it. Thank you. Okay, we'll take the one question in the back and then we'll take one more question after that. Hi, I'm Chloe, I'm a human development major. And my question is, in your presentation you talked about uh, limiting the access to social media, but I was wondering what your thoughts were on limiting access to social media of adolescents as a punishment. Mm -hmm. Well, it certainly could be effective, I think, for some young people because they are so, um, eager to be on it. You know, it's so important to so many of them. And I should be clear, there are individuals' differences in that too. I think not all young people are obsessed with social media, but it is important to a lot of them. Um, I do think if you need a consequence for misbehavior for a person who's an adolescent, taking away the phone is a pretty powerful consequence. Um, the CNN, for the CNN study, they, the producer of that show, the person who was the boss of the one I was working with, came up with the idea that they wanted the parents in the study to take away the kids' phones, tell them they were taking away the kids' phones for a weekend and then take their reactions. They thought this would be a really fun addition to the program. And they sent me some of these videos of these kids wailing and crying and being distraught. And I was appalled. I'm like, that's really mean. If they, you know, give them back the phone. If they didn't do anything, don't. Like, that's really, really upsetting them. This is not funny. This is not good television. Give them back their phones was my message. Um, as, a, as a parent, I have very rarely confiscated phones for severe misbehavior, never for very long, uh, maybe for a day or less. The reason I never do it for long is that I rely on that as a tool to keep in touch with my children. Um, so it was a punishment for me as much as it was a punishment for them. I think there's really no way to limit access to social media unless you do take the phone, and even then they can get on computers or look on their friends' devices, and so it's not perfect. To me, it's a very serious punishment. Is It is a very upsetting, serious ordeal to an adolescent to be separated from their social media and from their phone, and I think it should be used for only the most serious of infractions. That's my two cents. All right, thank you. Do we have one, time for one more question? Thank you, uh, and appreciate all the research you did here. It was very interesting. Uh, on the research you did on gossip, I found that interesting. Uh, and, and clearly, in the scenario where someone's, you know, saying that you're fat, you know, somebody interjecting to cut that off quickly makes intuitive sense to me. Um, but when gossip is more, uh, I'm interested in what your perspective on the boundary between gossip and just criticizing something and mm -hmm. expressing you know, frustration with a teacher or a friend or mm -hmm. a parent um, and whether that's an activity that needs to be cut off right away or not. Um, and for, uh, you know, selfish reasons, I'd be interested in your perspective on something my wife and I have talked about um, with three young girls. And uh, a rule in our house, we have several, but one is if you criticize, you must compliment. Mm -hmm. So we allow them to criticize something, but you are criticizing, you need to step back and at the end of it, say something nice mm -hmm. about that person or that nice. thing or whatever. Mm -hmm. Would be interested in your, that's different though than yeah. your recommendation just to cut it off at the pass. Be interested in your perspective on that. I like the idea of if you must criticize, then you must compliment. I think in general, in life, in academia maybe especially, it is way too easy and way too much fun to tear things down. And it is harder and more intellectually challenging to recognize the strengths of an argument, a person, whatever. So I think it is a very good exercise 
to require children to do that. And you can ask them to do it after they criticize something, but in general, I think we need to model for our children pointing out the things that are good. Or if you're going to criticize, as I always tell my students, if you're gonna run down some article you read or whatever, that's fine, but you tell me how to do it better. You tell me how to do that study better, and then I will really respect you. I don't respect the people who can always put things down. You can always tear things up. How do you build them? How do you create? How do you do something constructive? So I think that's a wonderful strategy. Gossip is so fascinating to me because it is such a fine line. The origin of that word is God plus sib, speaking in a godly way of your siblings. Gossip doesn't have to be terrible, you know, but it sometimes is. So how do you decide? Um, Gossip might also serve some positive developmental functions. If we want to understand why people gossip and we want to maybe reduce it, we think, what function does it serve? And it looks to me like when adolescents gossip, and sociologists talk about this, it might be a form of moral negotiation. So if you're, say, a 14-year-old girl and you're trying to work out what's okay to wear, you know, how much skin can you show, for example, it's hard to sit down with your friends and say, you know, what do you think? Like, is it okay to wear really low cut tops or should we not? Yeah, they can't have that conversation. But if they see somebody wear something a little bit revealing, they can lob out an ugly statement to their group and they can see, could you see what she was wearing? She looked like a hussy, you know? Say that to the peer group is a way of testing the waters. It's a way of seeing what your peer group thinks. So it can serve some positive functions. Um, it can also be negative, and I think what we always have to ask ourselves as adults and teach our children to ask themselves is, it's really simple, it's what a lot of school principals say. Before you, anything comes out of your mouth, you ask yourself, is it honest, is it kind, and is it necessary? And if all three are not true, you keep it to yourself. So much of the ugly stuff we say is venting, it doesn't have to be said, it hurts people when we say it. It's a real challenge to yourself to think, do I really have to do this? Do I really? Or at least you can confine it. You know, I know I'm happily married, blessed for a long time with a wonderful husband, and, and I can really talk to him about things that are frustrating me at my job in a way that would be completely inappropriate if I said it to anybody in my work environment. But I can say it to my trusted life partner, and he can hear it, and he can help me think through it. And I don't think I've done serious harm to anyone when I do that. Um, unfortunately, our children don't have those kinds of relationships yet. It's a goal to help them build them. But I think the kind of, is it honest, is it kind, is it necessary, is a good way to help them think about do they have to say it. At home with the family, at a dinner table conversation could be a safe place for them to criticize or to express their frustration, say, with the teacher. You wouldn't want them saying that to everybody on the school playground. But you're their mom and dad, so for them to say that to you is all right, maybe. But then to ask them to find something positive seems to me like a good idea. Thank you all so much. Well, thank you for the additional questions that elicited those interesting responses. Um, now, as an expression of our appreciation for your coming here, we'd like to present you with this clock. This is beautiful. So this Thank is entitled you. The Marjorie Pay Hinckley Lecture 2016, Marion K. Underwood. This is gorgeous. Thank so, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.